Hey, and welcome to today's session on social network analysis part two. In part one of social network analysis, I spoke about network structure that basically we took static social networks, well, networks are never static, but we took kind of like snapshots of, of social networks and then analyzed their structures, developed different measures uh, on the network in order to understand its structure a little bit better. And today we will talk explicitly about network dynamics. That means how network change, uh, how networks themselves change and how they change inside. So if we are with our computational scientific methods, we are still, as social network analysis is, in the analysis part, in the analytical part. So social network analysis is an analysis, which is kind of like in between the empirical and the theoretical on these both ends. But uh, today explicitly, we will go a little bit beyond the analysis itself, network structures, a lot of analysis. We'll still do some analysis on networks, but we will go actually also in the theoretical part. Right there. So that already shows you that it's not as clear cut as, as it might be in, insinuated here by this graph. Uh, some of these methods you can use to analyze, but you can also use them to build theory, the same as you can use some tools that you use for building theory in order to analyze data, for example. So today we will do a theory on networks and see how networks also should involve. So that brings us a little bit to this last part of this course, which is the theoretical uh, aspect of social science. Okay, so again, we will answer three questions. The first question is, how do networks evolve? And this first question is actually answered by the second and the third question. The third question is how we can we predict what kind of network will form? So how will networks evolve? So, well, different networks will form over time. So the, the network itself changes. And then the second answer to the question how networks evolve is how can we predict what will happen inside the network? So the network changes inside itself and some dynamic is happening on the network, we could we would say. So the first thing is the network itself changes, the node and the links changes. And then in this in the in the third part, we will talk about dynamics that happen on the network. In order to get a bit better glimpse of that, I want to start by showing you this video of Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, James Fowler from, from UCSD, uh, about a network evolution over 32 years. Have a look. So what this video essentially shows is that weight gain happens in clusters. Now, there are two interpretations to that. On the one hand, and that was the big headline as the title of the, of the study is The Spread of Obesity. Uh, the headline was of like, obesity is contagious, right? It's not contagious like uh, you touch somebody and, and then they get infected and they gain weight. No, it's contagious in a social sense, in a sense of social, social contagion. So basically groups uh, you, you join a group uh, and this group has a tendency to be overweight, you will also start uh, to gain weight as being part of this group. So this is one interpretation, the spread, uh, the contagious, social contagious effect of obesity. And the other interpretation could also be homophily. Remember, remember uh, homophily, what that is? Oh, that basically birds of a feather flock together. That means that it could also be that since if you're obese, you tend to join a group of obese people. And if you're a sporty person, a very athletic person, you tend to join groups with very athletic people. And these effects are, are very subtle to piece apart, uh, homophily or, and or contagion. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go into the detail, but you can see that what we clearly saw here is that weight gain happens in clusters. And we saw two effects what happens on the network. On the one hand, and that is our second point, is we saw a different network forming. We saw these clusters forming of obese, and non-obese people. And second of all, there's happening also something inside the network. 
uh, especially if you think about it kind of like contagion, then something spreads, something diffuses on the network. These are the two ways network can evolve and do evolve. So let's dive into the second question a little bit deeper. What kind of network will form and can we actually predict that? That's one of the benefits of science. One is explaining things, and the other one is predicting things. So can we predict what kind of network will actually form? And um, luckily for us, there are some particular shapes of networks that tend to form very frequently. The, the role of them is similar to if you have ever taken a statistics class. There are, there are some kind of distributions you often run into, the normal distribution, the bell curve, the Poisson distribution, the exponential distribution, right? It doesn't mean uh, these are the only distributions out there. There's an infinite number of distributions, how, how things can be distributed. But very often, we run into a normal distribution. That's why it's called normal, because it, 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 it shows up quite often, or an exponential distribution or a power law distribution. And there's a handful of distributions that are very useful because they often often uh, turn up. Now, in networks, uh, something very similar happens. There's a handful of network formations that occur actually very frequently. That doesn't mean that these are the only network. There's an infinite number of network constellations, but particularly in social science, I picked four here, four network constellations that, that occur quite frequently, and it's useful to understand them. One is random networks. The second one is called scale-free networks. Third, small world networks. So that's, that's a technical term, seriously. And the last one I picked is hub and spoke or, or a star network. So let's start with random networks. Random networks are extremely useful because if we, if you look at our scientific, in our scientific method, uh, they allow us to actually do hypothesis testing. They allow us to ask if there's anything special about our network or if the network is just random. Really, literally, you can you take the random, like you say it colloquially, you know, uh, colloquially, just that's just a that's just a random thing. That's just like that's like the most random thing. I, that's like the most random network, right? That just here happens. So if it's just like a random network, or is there something special about my network? So I create some random networks and test my network against it. For example, if we take our scientific method of induction, and you already know, you can go through this circle in in different ways. Darwin went through it as induction. So first we make our observations. Now we don't go to Galapagos and computational methods. Uh, we go to an online source, for example, a digital footprint about online friends. And you find an online friend network with different global, local, and individual measures of your network. So you collected this data and then you analyze it and you find that some people have more friends than others. So you build your hypothesis. Uh, based on this, on this pre-analysis, and, and you hypothesize that the ones with high closeness centrality have more friends. Remember what closeness centrality was? Right, so it depends, uh, that, that measures how close a node is to all the others on average. And you can say, well, that's an hypothesis, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but now you can test it. So in order to test this hypothesis, uh, you ask, well, might it just be a, a random chance that some have more friends than others? Or is there something really, really in my hypothesis? Is, is, is there some, some truth to my hypothesis that closeness centrality here plays a role? or degree centrality, or eigenvector between, or, or, or whatever measure you, you want to test in your hypothesis, right? Um, so if you want to test if it's just random chance, what you do is you create random networks, and then you can compare it to that. So that's one use of random networks. There are sp specific kinds of, you can fine tune that. These are called exponential random graphs, uh, ergams, but again, there's exponential random graphs. So it's the same kind of idea. It's just that there you fine tune a little bit the specificities of your, of your network. Well, and then, you make your theory once this hypothesis is rejected or if you cannot reject it, a theory is a family of these kind of different models and you go back to your phenomena, right? So that's why random networks are very, very important because they allow us to test hypotheses in our scientific method. Now, you can also go through that the other way around. You can use 
uh, random networks the other way around if you go through the circle. Uh, start from the other way and for example with our glass of red wine scientific method. So as my two mentors, uh, Monji and Contractor, say in their, in their book about social network analysis, they say, well, you verbally deduce hypothesis by exam examining the lo logical interrelationships among the verbal statements offered by the theory. So let's do that. So, right, we have a, a phenomena here and we verbally deduce by examining the logical interrelationships. So um, we have an idea and uh, offered by the verbal statements of some kind of theory, we, we, have, we have the idea that people who communicate a lot have more friends. All right, that's that's an idea that that you might get just by by living in in this in this reality by obs observing this phenomena and just by being there, and then you deduce your hypothesis uh, by saying, well, the ones with high degree centrality in the communication network that means those who have a lot of ingoing and outgoing communication connections also have a high degree centrality in the friendship network. So that's a, a multiplex network, right? Communication and friendship. Remember what a multiplex network is? Yes, if you have different kind of links, right? So here you have communication and then, and then you have a friendship network, communication network and a friendship network, and then you have your hypothesis. Now, again, you might ask, well, is it just random chance? So you create your random networks, uh, you, you collect your data, you would go around this way, then you analyze your data, and then you find that my network is different from this random network, and then you go back to the phenomenon. So random networks are very important because they're always, then you can use them, they appear at the part of the hypothesis if I use them for hypothesis testing. So that's the idea behind, behind and that's one of the major benefits of random networks. Random networks technically are often called Erdos Renyi graphs. Again, the word graph is often used synonymously to the word network because in mathematics, mathematically it's a graph. So they are called Erdos Renyi networks or Erdos Renyi graphs. Erdos Renyi are actually a very, uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting combi uh, combination of math mathematicians. Renyi got famous because he had this, he, he made this statement that a mathematician is basically a machine that converts coffee into theorem, and Erdős was actually a, a, a much more interesting character. He basically lived on a suitcase. So he, he had about 500 collaborators in his life, and he published 1,500 papers. That's a lot. If you're a very accomplished scholar, even nowadays, you're a senior at a very accomplished scholar, you have maybe 200 papers. These are kind of like the Many people don't get to 200 paper an entire scientific career. He had 1,500, and how he did that, he actually traveled. He really lived in a network. He was always at conferences. He was at people's houses. He expected them to host them, to wash his laundry, and then also to help him to get to the next place. And then he would go to the next collaborator, and usually when he would be at the front door, he would just say, my brain is open. Right. And then he would collaborate with somebody for a few days, give him a very genius mathematician, genius mathematicians, and then move on. So Erdős himself has a very prolific network of collaborators. People often also try to understand how close they are to Erdős in their publishing. So if I publish a paper, I can see how many degrees of separation I'm from Erdős. That's called your Erdős number. Um, so he, he lived in this network, and and what these two uh, coffee junkies, Erdős also drank a lot of coffee, uh, it is reported. What these two coffee junkies came up with is this idea of these random networks, random graphs, and that's that's what they what they said how you how you do it. You start with a specific number of nodes, n nodes, and then you form independent links, and you basically random them, cre randomly create these links among these nodes, so kind of like you throw them in. You can do that in two ways. One way would be with a certain probability, P, let's say 20%, with, with 20%, each node can, can grow a link, or you have just a certain number of links, let's say M, M links, and you throw these M links randomly into the network and see like what they connect with uh, in your nodes. And that gives you this benchmark, it's called G for graph, and then NP, N is the number of nodes, and P is the probability that 
the node can grow a link or have a link, or G and M. N is again the number of nodes, and M is the number of this. Either you have a probability of creating a link or you have the number of links in that. And then you can look at some properties that these random networks actually should have. For example, you can ask in a random network, what's the average degree of this network? And you can do that in two ways. You can have a numerical solution. And these are two ways you can solve actually any, there are basically two ways you can solve a problem. The one is a numerical solution that basically means you simulate and you just count. So let's do that. So if we have a random network here of G, graph, N, let's say three nodes, and M, um, two links, then we can have exactly three different graphs. So we have three nodes and two, two links. Every link has two degrees. So we can get, these are all the graphs we can make with this setup. If you have a bigger, more nodes and more links, you can make many more combinations of graphs. But in this setup, we can only make three kind of graphs. Please convince yourself, that's, that's all the graphs you can do with three nodes and two links. So now we can ask, now we have all of them and we can just now count. What's the average degree of a network with these specifications, a random network with these specifications? Well, we have four degrees. Every link has two degrees, right? And three nodes. So the average degree is 1.333, like 1 1.13, right? One and a third. So that's the average degree of this network. The other way I can do this also analytically, that means I just don't throw it out and I count, I really I scratch my head and come up with a formula. That's what the formula looks like, n minus one multiplied with p if I have the probability. So if I have my g and p network, sometimes it's useful to have the m, sometimes it's useful to have the p, that's how they define it. I also get the same result, one and a third links on average. That would be the average number of degrees per nodes. Now, the good thing is, the nice thing is that we get almost surely the proper specific properties with a specific setup of a random network. So if I specify a network with so many nodes and so many links, then almost surely I get a specific property. Like here I have the property that on average every node has one and a third links. So I can ask the question, what's the degree distribution as well of a network? So if I throw it randomly in, uh, how do these links actually distribute? Uh, and and the, the fact that I get that almost surely is the same as if you're ever taking a statistics class, not necessary to follow what I say, but if you have, you know about these distributions, these distributions grow with a large number. So it's because of the law of the large number. So for example, if I flip a coin, I get a binomial distribution, but I do that a lot, it would approximate the continuous normal distribution. So the more you do it, the more certainty you have that you get, for example, to the averages, that you get an average behavior because the by the laws of, of large, by the law of large numbers, basically. That's why you almost surely, with enough, with enough nodes and links, you get certain characteristics. I could also ask other question. For example, what's the likelihood of getting a hub with almost all links concentrated on it alone? Uh, which could happen. I mean, by chance, I throw my links in and they could, by chance, just all connect to one node. I mean, it's a chance game, it's a random network. It, it might be very unlikely that all the links just fall on this one node if I do it randomly, but there's still a light probability, so I can calculate that now. Uh, or I can ask, uh, when are most nodes connected in one giant component? Uh, remember what a, a component is, again? So a component is when, when things are connected, we have the strong and the weakly connected component, but a com component is when the nodes are kind of like connected uh, in, 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 one, in, in one group. And a giant component is basically the largest, the largest component. So we can ask, uh, when are most nodes actually connected, when there are no isolate groups anymore, no separate groups, when they're all in. And that's a very important question because if everybody is connected, if there are no isolate groups that are not connected, for example, a disease could spread to everybody or an innovation could spread to everybody. So when do these giant components emerge? And let's go into that question a little bit deeper because it tells us something interesting how these random networks uh, behave. Often they have threshold function. That means nothing happens for a long time and then there are these tipping points and suddenly something happens, right? So um, these, are, these are these tipping points threshold function. 
So we can ask, at what average degree does a giant component emerge? So that's an emergent phenomena. It happens. So for example, to make it more concrete, how many friends do your friends need to have for information or a disease to spread quickly throughout most of the networks? So that's actually what I'm asking. So the giant component is when most, most are connected, then a disease can spread would be a negative thing, or an innovation could spread, could be a positive thing, or political opinion can spread, or that depends on if you like, if that's a good or bad thing, depends on if you like the political opinion or not, or a rumor or a lies, a fake news could spread through, through the entire network if everybody is connected. So when do we have networks where everybody is connected? How many friends do you and your friends on average, how many friends does everybody need to have in order for us to have most people connected in one giant, one giant component. That's the technical term of it. So let's do a numerical simulation and just by simulating a lot of random networks, see that on average, what, are the, what do we find? How many numbers of, of, of friends do my friends need to have? What's the average degree that we need in order for this giant component to emerge, right? Very straightforward. We just simulated many times. And I use a software here called NetLogo, a software that we will use a lot today uh, and also in other lectures. And that helps you a lot to simulate this. It makes it very easy to simulate these kind of things. All right. So here I have my random network. I have 50 people that I just threw on. I don't have a network. I have 50 people, unconnected people. And now I randomly pick two of these people and I connect them. So randomly out of these 50 people that I created here, I connect uh, two of them always. Or I can also add them. So here, for example, I added one to a pair that already existed. And I have, that's my giant component that's red. So that's the largest connected subpart of this, of this component. Now you saw here, now I have five a group of three and a group of two merged into this giant component. And my giant component is also increasing. Uh, the likelihood of connecting with anybody is uniform here. It's a random network. So, but the giant component is already big. Sometimes people connect to somebody of the giant component and the giant component is increasing with that then. So here I have a pretty large giant component then already and you sometimes see well, sub subgroups start to merge into it. So that's the idea. And that's the idea of what's happening uh, with the giant component. At the end, you see like most people are now connected to the giant component. What you see here on the side on this little graph over there is it measures the fraction of people in the giant component and the connection per node. So here, for example, we have four people in the giant component now. And you see by the little red line, not a lot happens. Oh, here now we have two of, uh, connected with four and four, and now both of them connected. And what happened is now a, a big fraction, now 16, 17% of the, of the people are already in the giant component. So that made a big jump. But still, the connectivity is, is pretty low. The percentage, the fraction of people in the giant component is pretty low, as we can see. And now we have two components, one that's the, a little bit bigger, and the other ones that not, oh, but it also can switch uh, between them. And check out what happens now. Now these two big groups merged, and that gave us a big jump in the fraction of people that are in the giant component. So what basically happens, subgroups groups build up, and at one point, all these subgroups start to emerge. And that gives us a big push in the number of people that are in the giant, in the largest component. So see again down here, nothing happens, about 12%, 13%, 15% are in the giant component. And then at one point, it starts to go up. Right, it's pretty flat, pretty flat, and at one point it starts to go up. And the question is when that happens. Well, as you can see here indicated by this line, that happens if you have on average one, one connection per person. Right, that's, that's when this starts to happen. Let's do this again. Let's run it again to see if there's something to that. Yeah, nothing happens a lot. The, the fraction in the giant component is pretty low. And suddenly, after we get to this threshold of one connection per node, boom, it starts to go up. There's this, there's this phase transition, this tipping point, this threshold function after which uh, things start to change. So there's a qualitative difference. More is different. You can add and add and add, and at one point, well, it becomes qualitatively different. So uh, emergence happens. Now, why is it one connection per node? What is special with one connection per node? Well, think about it. If you have your group of friends here, you have yourself, and then you have a friend, and then you have a friend, and then you have a friend. 
uh, if there's minimum one connection, right? Yeah, we can all be connected. If we have less than that, we might not all, we cannot be all connected. Uh, and after we have one, one connection per node, yes, we can all be connected. And then what you saw here in the simulation as well, what often happens is we have these groups and then these groups start to merge seven subgroups in this giant component, and then we get really a giant component. Most people, once these groups start to merge, happen to be in this giant component, and that's why you get this, this tipping point function here. Mathematically, you can, if you think about it more, and, and if, that's, if that's what you're into, you can see that, 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 that when that happens, if the probability of making a connection is larger than one divided by the number of nodes, then you get this giant components, and cycles, by the way. Remember what cycles were? You get them too uh, after after that threshold, and you can have other things. For example, uh, if you have a probability equal to the logarithm of the number of nodes divided by the number of nodes, you will get a fully connected network, a fully connected network. Um, and uh, so these are different things that you can say about about the network with almost certainty. So almost surely these things will happen. Almost surely, as you saw, we run the simulation a few times. Every time it's a little bit different, but there is something we always saw after it hit this threshold, something qualitatively different happened. Now, when you use a random network in order to test hypothesis, since you know that in random networks, almost surely these kind of properties will emerge if your, your empirically observed network the network that you scraped on your favorite social media sites doesn't have these properties. You can say that with less likelihood, or it's very unlikely that this network that you have is a random network, at least with the specifications that you gave it. You can also give this network other specifications. Right? So if you do an exponential random graph model, you would specify some other things. This being said, they are not only uniform distributed. Uh, networks, just like we have the erdos reni networks, there are other ways to even grow networks. So for example, what happened in erdos reni networks uh, that I talked about now, we had a stable number of nodes, the number of nodes were given, and then we threw the number of links in, m, m links we just threw in, uniform distributed, or with a certain probability, a stable probability, a node would grow a link, right? So that's, that's what we had until now. Now I can also change the number of nodes. I can increase the number of nodes as another mechanism of growing a network. And I can start that very simply by adding nodes with uniform likelihood. So I would start with a certain number of nodes in a fully connected network, right? And then I add new nodes with a certain number of links, and these links connect to these existing nodes with uniform likelihood. So for example, imagine there's there's the cool table in, in, in high school and, and, and a certain number of people sits on this table and a new kid comes in and this new kid during this lunch break can make three connections and these connections then are with uniform likelihood, a third, a third, a third with equal probability, kind of like reaching out to these existing nodes, the, the, the kids on the cool table. So, and then another one comes in and the same thing happens. Can you say already something about the dynamic? For example, over time, who will have more nodes? The people who were there first or the people who come in later as a general tendency? Who will have, who will accumulate more nodes? Well, yeah, the older nodes will have more links because it's, uniform likelihood is there's an equal probability that I will connect. So by just by random chance, let's say the five kids that were there first at the cool table, they will accumulate more. Whereas the person who just came in, you know, has, has, less, has actually no connection made, made to him or herself because it just came in. If you've been there before, you maybe received a few connections, but on, on average, the older will have more connections. So, oh yeah, we can already make some predictions about how these kind of networks evolve. Now, uh, these connections don't have to be with uniform likelihood. And actually, in reality, it almost never happens with uniform likelihood. Uh, because what we find in reality, if we look at social networks, particularly, but that also happens in other networks, in neural networks or, or, or uh, infrastructure networks, that some nodes have many more links than others. Actually, what we often find is that exponentially few, exponentially few nodes have exponentially many connections 
and exponentially many nodes have exponentially few. So there are many nodes, really many nodes that have kind of like one or two connections only, and there are few nodes who have a lot of connections. So uh, that's often called the fair tail distribution. Here. It's a power law. That's the technical term of the statistical distribution. Now, the mechanism how you create uh, a, such an unequal power law distribution, that's a really skewed distribution, income, for example, income in a society is also distributed according to the same effect. There are exponentially few people in society that have exponentially much income, a lot of income, and exponentially many people in society that have exponentially little income. So that's also a power law called the Pareto distribution. If you're from economics, you might have heard of it. It's the same logic. So how is that? Is that created? It's created by preferential attachment in a network. The result is this scale-free network. It's also called scale-free because if you have a power law, um, yes, they, they are scale-free. It doesn't do if you zoom in and out, it has to do with fractals. We don't, don't have time to go into that. Uh, you can imagine it with fractals. That's where the term comes from of, of a scale-free scale -free network. So it means it depends on, independent from the, from the scale that you look at the network, it, it, looks, it looks very similar, itself similar. Preferential attachment means that the likelihood that you connect with somebody is proportional to the number of existing degrees. So that means the person who already has a lot of connections, it's much more likely to receive another connection. There's a preferential attachment to the person with a lot of connections already. And we often see that in reality, to go back to my example of the cool table in high school, uh, the most popular kid that's on this cool table has already a lot of connections and you kind of like you're drawn to this person too, right? People are drawn to the most popular kid. So the person who has a lot already will get more. It's almost like a biblical term, right? The rich get richer. So that's where what preferential, preferential attachment is and the the poor get poorer. So those who have giveth and those who have nothing take it away, right? Who have little take it away. So that's the idea of preferential attachment, also called Yule's rule. And how we can do that more formally, if you don't trust your intuition, more formally, that's what it looks like. If, if you're like me and you don't trust your intuition, uh, I will walk you quickly to the formalism, but if your intuition is fine, if you understood that, that's also fine, right? So there are new nodes. Um, every new node adds M links a certain number of links to existing nodes. So at time t, every time that happens at a time step, uh, there will be t times m links, right? And the total number of degrees is t times m times 2 because they're basically 2, two degrees per link. And the probability of attaching, an, uh, attach, attaching to a node is then j. So that's the, uh, the number of degree divided by 2 times t times, uh, times m. So that's, that's the formalism of how you can grow these kind of networks. All right, so let's grow some scale-free preferential attachment networks. I start here with two nodes. So there are only two nodes and uh, preferential attachment says that the likelihood that a new node, if a new node comes in and a new node comes in and connects we say now the connection is one, the new node comes with one link, we just define could come with two links, but in this case, we just define it comes with one link. So there's an equal likelihood it connects to each one of them, right? Because, because each one of them is equally likely. So let's do that. Let's throw in a new a link. Oh, and it connects to that one. And we threw in another link and it connected to, to the middle one. So what we have now is the middle node and I show you by that by increasing the size a little bit, the middle node now has three connections. So it's three times more likely, it's proportional, it's three times more likely to get a connection now than the other three. That means the other three could still get, if a new node comes in, somebody could connect, you know, to kind of like an outsider, but with more likelihood, it will connect to the one who has the highest connection. So it's proportional. Three times could be, or there could be another rule of how proportional it is. Um, and we can see here in this graph, this graph is very important, keep on watching this graph, we can see that there is actually one, one node with, uh, this way goes the number of degrees, so one node with three uh, degrees and three nodes with only one degree. So on the x-axis is the number of degree, one node with three and three nodes with one. That's how you read this graph. So let's keep on going then.
and throw in another node. And it connected to an outsider. Well, I said, there's still the chance it connects to an outsider. Uh, oh, now it connected again to the main hub. And we can see, well, th there's one outsider that actually also gains some probability of being connected. Oh, now the main hub keeps on connecting, keeps on collecting, keeps on collecting, keeps on accumulating, and gets bigger and bigger. And the bigger it gets, the rich get richer, right? Those who have give them. And uh, that's what actually happens here. There are two little hubs outside. They they also make some friends. They're, they're kind of like popular and sometimes uh, somebody connects to them. But if you look at the graph, actually, what also happens uh, on the graph is that there are many, very few, there are very few nodes who have a lot of degrees. And many nodes, most nodes, actually, they have only one connection, right? Most are pendants. Pendants. Remember, there's a technical term of if you just have one connection to it. So most node actually pendants. There are some other subhubs, smaller hubs that are in there, but there are many, very few nodes. Actually, it's one big node, one big hub, one popular kit that actually keeps on accumulating and becomes more popular and more popular and more popular. So at the end, if we now have 200 nodes, we see that most of these 200 nodes actually have only one degree. And this one node in the center has more than 70, has more than 70 degrees. So that's the richest one. And actually started with a path dependency. It started right from the beginning when just this node was lucky to receive more nodes and more connections. And then decided, remember at the beginning, there were only two. Each one of them could have been it, and then came a third. Each one of these three could have been it, but then at the end, it started to it started to set in a path dependency, which then determined this outcome. And that's what often happens in this kind in this kind of mechanism. So let's do that again to see if you just would like. We start again with our two nodes. Uh, add another one. We have now here. Uh, we have kind of like a hub already that we can see, but we have several hubs. So let's see, we have one in the middle, and then there are some other hubs growing around there. So in this case now, we have one, two, three, four hubs. Well, that's just like, you know, we, we rolled the dice and it might have been unlikely that the most popular kids gets not the connection, but there's still a probability and that's what happened in this case. And we have several hubs. Now, this the, the average degree distribution, look at our graph, is still this power law. So there's still this very much inequality where we have very few, it might not be one in this case, might be three, four, five hubs that have a lot of connections, uh, over 20, 30, 40 connections maybe. And there are many, most, most uh, nodes actually only have, still have one. You can see that in the graph, they're just pendants. They just have one connection. So you get a different network structure. That's not a random network. It's not random in a sense of uniformly random. There's still probability in how we connect to them. But we get these hubs, these hubs that actually connect to many, and we have a extremely unequal degree distribution. A degree distribution is not uniform, but distributed according to a power law. Exponentially few, exponentially few nodes. Here we have a few with exponentially many connections and exponentially many nodes is our pendants with exponentially few connections. So if you take for you who are interested and, 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 have, and work with logarithms, if you take the logarithms on both, you get this straight line and that's the lower graph you can see here. You get this basically a straight line on a log log plot between the degree and the number of nodes. So you get a straight line and a log log plot, which is the signature of a power law, a scale free distribution. Now for you that are interested why this word scale free is because if you would keep on growing, growing this network, you would get a very, very big network. If you look at it, you get some hubs. Then if you zoom in, for example, Keep take one of your favorite uh, subclusters here, some of your favorite sub hubs here. You zoom in on that, you will see a similar structure, a self similar structure. Also, there will be one big hub with a smaller hub and a smaller hub, and then you zoom in again, depending how your, how big your network is, and you will see the same: some big, some small. So, independent from your scale, the network will always look kind of like that, right? That's why it's called a scale free. And scale free networks are grown by preferential attachment. Now, these have been two idealized versions. We had uniform connection or preferential attachment, pref uh, which is proportional to the number of, of connections that you already have. And we can also have hybrid models. 
So let's take our random connection and our preferential connection and preferential attachment and mix them up a little bit. So hybrid models, for example, could work something like this to grow networks. Uh, for example, we could take a, a fraction of the links and connect them uh, uniformly at random and another fraction by, for example, looking at friends of friends uh, of the connected nodes, right? So uniformly, I, I, unif at random, uniformly with equal likelihood, I just connect to some and then and then I look at the friends of those that I that I randomly uh, connected at right so for example uh, you meet somebody at random and then yes it is likely that you also will get to know their friends it's more likely that you meet somebody else at random again right so usually especially because triangles is the triadic closure remember that the triadic closure and the clustering coefficient uh, what was that about Yes, yeah, so, so that it's very likely that triangles will actually close. So you meet somebody and then you will get to know their friends and you very likely, that's what we often see in social science data, that you will become friends of, of the friends of your friends. Now, uh, for example, you come in here and you meet a group of people and you randomly connect to those two and then preferably you start to connect to their friends, not randomly to anybody in the network, you walk your you walk your way through this network and, and get to know other people. Right? Now, interestingly enough, most of my friends are connected to highly connected people. It means if you randomly meet somebody, it's very likely that they are connected to highly connected people. Why is that? Well, that's that's simply because uh, highly connected people have lots of friends. That's why they are highly connected, right? So you can turn it the other way around. People who are highly connected are highly connected because they have a lot of friends, which makes it very likely that, that your friend is connected to a highly connected person because this person has a lot of friends. That's why it's, you know, very likely to be, uh, very likely to be connected to your friend, right? As it's very likely to be connected to many others that because it is highly connected. Right, so if you look at it from, from the other side, it, it, becomes, it becomes evident why that is. Now, the second part is preferential attachment. Uh, why is that? Well, that's simply because uh, nodes with more connections are easy to find and will grow more friends. So the ones who are highly connected, which are likely connected to your friends, they're easier to find as well. They're easy to find because they have more connections. So almost naturally, see, that's why we find preferential attachments so often in social networks, because they almost naturally happen. The rich get richer. The ones who have many connections will receive more connections because they're easier to find, especially if you make your way through the, through the social networks and get to know one person, get to know another person. It's very likely that you find somebody who's highly connected, which with your getting to know you increases, incre like the rich get richer, they get more degrees, more connections, and so forth. And in reality, if we mix these two models, so these are two mixed one, a random connection and then a preferential con uh, attachment network, that often, that fits, for example, very good the World Wide Web data. So in this study here, they have shown that the World Wide Web, that means the distribution of how web pages are connected on the World Wide Web is a third at random and two thirds preferential attachment. So in the World Wide Web, you might think, well, it's preferential attachment. You try to connect to very connected websites, but that's not the case. A third is really random. You just, if you set up your new website, you randomly connect to some, but it might seem random to you. It might make sense to who you connect, but there's from the overall picture from the bird's eye view for us, it would look random. Why do you connect to these random pages? Well, there may be, you know, I, I really like these things, but then two thirds, you're driven by this preferential attachment logic. You will connect to highly connected nodes as well. So that's an example of a hybrid model. Now we mixed random and preferential attachment. Now we can use also other models. For example, we could use a random network and then the other fraction connecting it by geographic proximity. Or just by, yeah, by, by proximity of, of, of who you encounter. For example, you, you start to, to, to stand in line at a, at, at, to, to pay your lunch and you're the cafeteria, you work out of the cafeteria with your lunch, you meet somebody at random and then the other person you meet might not be the friend of this person, but might be somebody who's just close. 
in this case, right? So they might, so it might be also that. So you can make your own model and find a mechanism that actually also uh, theorize in theory satisfies the mechanism you are after and, and then make hybrid models and see how much of the growth of this network is according to this mechanism, random preferential attachment, geographic proximity just to have three and, and see where that comes from and then grow, simulate in theory your networks and then compare to the network that you found and you can show like, well, that's, that's, I think, how this network actually grows. All right, so we did random network, scale-free network. Let's go to another one, small world network. That's really a, a technical term. And that comes from the fact that people use that a lot. People use a lot, sometimes at a party and you hear somebody saying, what? What a small world, right? Are you also here? Like, what, what a small world. So the parties, the conversations, like, wait, wait, uh, Veronica? That's, that's the same Veronica who is the sister of the soccer coach of my brother's classmate? That Veronica? What? You know her as well? What a small world. Now, now check out what just happened here, right? So uh, she is the sister of, of the soccer coach of, of, of the classmate of your brother. So these are four degrees of separation. Uh, 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 what did we say? How many degrees of separation do you need kind of like on average to, to go around the world in, in social systems? How many were they? Well, the catchphrase is six degrees of separation, which comes from Milgram pioneering studies. And we see nowadays, actually, it's more like four, four or five degrees of separation. So anyway, between four and six, you can reach everybody on planet Earth. So actually, by the exponential power of networks, right, having four degrees of separation, yeah, it shouldn't be too surprising. Additionally, uh, social networks are usually not random, as I said before, so they're not Erders Rennie is kind of like an idealized model. Uh, sometimes they're preferential attachment networks or others just like these. So there's these clusters. Uh, so for example, you go to, to a hotel lobby, right? In Munich or in Sydney and you sit down in this hotel lobby and turn around and there is the same person behind you that you just saw three months ago at a hotel lobby in Santiago de Chile on, on the other end of the planet. What a small world. Right. But the fact is that you meet the same people in the hotel lobbies is because people tend to go to the same, same hotel chains. So these people always go to the Hyatt or the Sheraton or, or the Best West or whatever you have or the same kind of hotels, at least upper class, lower class or hostels and hostels. I used to backpack a lot in my young areas. You, you kind of like all over the globe sometimes meet the same people. And you say, like, what a small world. What a coincidence could that be? But that's because both of you are backpacking a lot and you meet them in similar hostels. Right. So actually, there's these clusters, for example, of backpack backpackers and, 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 and business people and Hyatt and Sheraton people. And that's why it seems like it's a small world, but it has to do with the network structure, actually. Now, that doesn't only happen in social networks. It also power grids and neural networks also happen to be happen to have a, a small world structure. So what a small world Networks. The six degrees of separation uh, argument is, is uh, the small average path length. That's a very good indication, but actually small world are technically defined by having two uh, characteristics. The first characteristic is they have a high level of clustering. So high level of clustering, that's how actually societies, uh, that's how actually societies are, are, are traditionally structured, right? So we've been in families. So uh, my friends mainly know uh, my friends mainly know also my friends. So, and my family is with my family, my friends are with my friends. So kind of like traditionally we are in these groupings and here's a group and there's a group, here's a family, a group of friends, there's a group. So we have a high level of clustering, actually. We cluster together, but with a high level of clustering, it's, it's unlikely and it takes longer to reach everybody. Right, because I, I, I'm connected very closely to my cluster of my friends and my friends are all connected to my friends. But to reach to somebody else, actually, that's very, that doesn't, that takes much longer. I might have to go to the other end of my cluster in order to bridge over, bridge over there, right? Now, the small world network turns out that they also have a small average path length. So that makes it likely to reach others very quickly. On average, so it has these two things. It, it's it's on one, it's clusterized, and at the same time, 
it's connected. Everybody is connected, but still clusterized. So it's kind of like a sweet spot between that. Erdos Reni, random graphs, uh, they, uh, they miss that completely because they have uniform clustering. All right, so let's do a, a net logo simulation again with that. And the net logo simulation on small worlds starts with a high clustering coefficient and with a very small average path length. So basically, just like human evolution, we are mainly connected to ourselves. And that's how we start. So, for example, we start here with our five nodes, and then each node is links to two of its neighbors. So, for example, here I have the blue node in the middle, and it links to its two neighbors on the left, and its two neighbors to the right. So that makes it a very high clustering, a local clustering, and every node is connected like this. For example, this node as well connects to the two on the left and uh, to the two on the right. The two on the left, I, I, I don't draw more. I could draw more nodes there just to, to keep it simple. I do that. Same on the other side, two on the left, two on the right, and these other two as well, right? They connect to the two on the left and the two on the right, and it could keep on going um, like this. All right. And then what we do is we rewire at random and uh, one connection and kind of like destroy this clustering and rewire it random to somebody who might be more distant. So let's look at it in, a, in our net logo uh, simulation as well. So I threw in here uh, 80 nodes and the 80 nodes are connected the way I just told you about. They're always to the two to the left and the two on the right. So as we can see here, the red one is connected to the two blue on the left and to the blue a two blue on the right. And that gives a very high clustering coefficient. So they're very much connected to the ones next to them. But what I do now is I throw a link at random over here, rewire them. So for example, here the one uh, next to the red node got reconnected. Here the second one next to, uh, left to the next to the red node got reconnected to the other side. That kind of like decreases my local clustering. I'm not so close anymore to the ones like next to me. And I reach out to somebody across the aisle. So what happens here in the graph, as you can see above, there is the blue dots that measures the clustering coefficient, CC. And that goes down the more re rewiring I do. So you can see really here that that goes down because I'm not so closely connected anymore to, to the ones next to me. And the average path length, APL, that's the red dots, also goes down. Well, the average path length means that it's quicker for me, on average, to reach anybody anybody in the network. On average, there's a, a smaller path length. So that also goes down. That's because when I connect across the aisle, I can quickly reach to the other side, right? I don't have to go around the circle in order to reach to the other side. Now I have these super highway bridges that I can take. And instead of going the long way over there, I can just, well, get into this and then cross over the aisle to the other side. So the average path length uh, from getting through every, from, for getting from everybody to everybody also goes down. Both the clustering coefficient goes down and the average path length goes down with this rewiring. All right. And you see what happens then here as I continue my, my rewiring, I destroy the local connectivity and reach across the aisle. What happens over time is you can see, well, the, the average path length kind of like bottoms out at one point because once I reach across the aisle, there's not, no, not much more I can reach across the aisle. Once I'm over there, I'm over there. So the more super highways I add it doesn't really give me a lot of uh, shortcuts, a lot of more shortcuts. And you can see at one point actually they cross over. Right, so uh, the clustering coefficient even goes down more because nobody is actually at that point connected anymore to their neighbors. They are just connected to anybody, so there's no local clustering anymore. And I get then again, that's not a small world network. That's just like overdoing it, and now I'm randomly connected to anybody in the network, and I have a stable average path length, and I have a low clustering coefficient. Now. The small world networks, what characterizes them? So now here we, we've been running it again from the beginning and you could observe it again. Well, every time you run it by random chance, you get it a little bit different. But the idea is, is that you find a sweet spot, a sweet spot where you still have a pretty high clustering coefficient. You're still connected very much to your neighbors. Just just how, what we find in social networks. You are very connected to your family, to your close friends. We just, as, as a species, we live in groups and we always have. So there's a high clustering coefficient. We're not uniformly, randomly distributed, uh, distributing our friendships. 
We have these groups, but as well we find these superhighways, these connections that kind of like reach across the ocean, reach across the aisle. Some people connect to the other, and that makes us pretty quickly getting to everybody in very few steps of separation. So once we run this again, you find the sweet spot, and that's actually what we call a small world network that still has a pretty decent clustering coefficient and a pretty small average path length. And that's what you can see. Now, once you keep on going and keep on going, rewiring, keep on going, rewiring, no, you won't get, you, you destroy the small world, a small world network again and get pretty much to a random, well, that's just a randomly connected network. That's what I wanted to tell you about small world networks, which leads us to our last a kind of network formation that I want to talk to you about. And I actually want to connect that to an entire branch of research that has to do with a very important question of how we can grow uh, a certain kind of network. So can we actually grow a network with particular, with particular characteristics? Often we said, well, the small world and the scale-free, the preferential attachment networks, they just, we find them often in society, so it's useful to grow them and then to study them. Um, or the random networks are kind of like a contrast to networks that we might find. But there's an entire another question that is, can we grow networks with certain characteristics, for example, uh, in a very efficient network or a very stable network? And for the social science, that's, of course, very important because, as I said, the social is actually is a network, right? The network is what makes the total more than the sum of its part. It, it makes a society out of individuals. So can we grow networks with these specific characteristics? And I want to expose you a little bit uh, to that to that idea now in this in this example. So one of the logics uh, we can go about it is uh, to take a logic from from economic cost and gains because uh, having and maintaining connections has uh, has benefits you gain from having friends, but it's also costly. You know, it takes takes your time, might take resources for a company to connect to many other companies, collaborators, clients. If you work in a team, if you have a team that's too big, um, there are so many people, you don't have time for everybody. So there are costs and there's benefits. The benefit might be that a big team gives you a lot of diversity of skills, but it's also cost. So, so we, we go with this, uh, with this, with this setup. So basically with the basic assumption that which is a very reasonable assumption that making connection has benefits, but also costs. And then we kind of like grow and rearrange and form the network. We add, for example, links. You could also add nodes. But let's go by adding links uh, that have certain costs and gains until we are in equilibrium. Equilibrium is when nothing changes anymore. So in physics, it has a definition, nothing changes. On, on average, things are in equilibrium. Or if you are happen to, to be from economics, you know, in equilibrium, the economy is, is pretty much stable. So sometimes people have this example of if you roll a ball in a sink, right? The ball keeps rolling until, until it stops, until it's in equilibrium, then nothing changes anymore. Uh, often in social negotiations, you can think about it that nobody can actually improve their position at the point of a stable equilibrium. Think about it like tic-tac-toe. So here you play tic-tac-toe and then a stable equilibrium would be either that one of the party wins or that you have a tie. For example, just like right now, you have, you have a tie and then you're in equilibrium. You're basically in deadlock in that. But an equilibrium is also useful because it makes it stable. If, if one person could still benefit, change something in benefit, well, the network will always change and always change and always change. So uh, if, if nothing changes, if nobody can get better or worse, then we are in equilibrium, basically, right? And then we have a stable network configuration. So that's our goal, to make the uh, network stable. That's one goal, and no link uh, or node can be added or deleted anymore. It's called a, a pairwise stable equilibrium. And now we also want to make the network efficient. Stable is one, and these are uh, complementary goals. And as we can see, there's a certain trade-off as well of making a network efficient and making it stable. Let's work with both of them. And we use a symmetric connections model. That's what it's called, and we look for efficiency. But while we go about it is we say, uh, given a certain cost and a benefit of links, what's the most efficient network structure? 
So for example, you could assume that, well, there's costs and benefits monetarily or time-wise. You can normalize that and say, you know, 80% you get a benefit out of making a connection and 20% is the, is the cost of, of having the connection. So it might be in dollars or in times, uh, you save you save 80% of the time, but it costs you 20% of the time in order if you keep the connection with this collaborator or, or in financial. So we, we work with this kind of trade-off. And, and these, 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 these values are defined by you, by your assumption, by what you find in empirical reality. So you look at empirical reality and you calibrate your model. That's the thing. Now, what we find is if we have a very low cost of making a connection, if it's, if it's basically free to make a connection, but we have a lot of gains, then the best network we can build is a completely connected network, right? If I can have only benefits and no downside, then I, the best thing is I just connect with everybody. Now, on the other hand, if I have a very high cost, if my cost of maintaining a connection is much higher actually than the benefit that I get from it, then I just cut ties, right? If all your friends are extremely annoying and just steal your time and, and your and your money and so forth. You, just, you better just stay at home by yourself. So if the cost is much higher than the benefit, then the empty network right, would be uniquely efficient. Otherwise, if if there's very low cost, the completely connected network is uniquely. What happens in between? Then usually we have something in between. There are some costs and some benefits, uh, and it turns out that there, in on, on general. You, you can come up with a star network. So the star network would be the result of being uniquely efficient. If the network is, and, and why the star network? Star network, uh, we, have, we have mentioned that before, for example, happens a lot. Uh, and you see that a lot, for example, in, uh, in airlines. That's, that's the reason why you always fly to some cities like Denver or, or Dallas and change planes, right? We said that's because it has a small average path length. If you go through the star, you can get to everybody quite, quite quickly still. And it has to do with a small average path length. But let's become a little bit more concrete and do it with a cost benefit analysis to show that in an intermediate, intermediate level of costs and benefit, the star network, the star configuration of the network is actually the uniquely efficient, stable uh, network configuration. All right. So we work with four nodes, very simple, and we have an empty network to begin with. No benefits of links because there are no links and no cost. That we have. Now we make the first connection two degrees. So two nodes benefit. Right. In that case, the left upper node benefits and the left lower node benefits because they have a connection and both of them also have costs. So we have two benefits and two costs. Let's go with this example that I mentioned before. So my benefit would be 80%. My cost would be 20%. And we normalize that between zero and one. It could also be, I don't know, a different, a different number in terms of dollars or time and, and calculate it this way. So we have two times a benefit of 0.8 minus two times a cost of 0 0.2. So two times 80% benefit minus two times 20% cost. Net, if you put that together, your net benefit would be 60, 0 0.6, right? 0 0.8 minus two, uh, that would be your net benefit. Now, if you calculate that out, you get 1.2. 0 0.6 plus 0 0.6 is 1.2. Uh, and that's your net benefit, your leftover benefit. You have a benefit of making this connection. So uh, your network would go from the empty network. It would make this first connection. It's more beneficial for this network to have one connection than not having anybody. So this network would evolve towards making one connection. It is beneficial. What happens to the second connection? Well, if I add a second connection, I have four benefits and four costs, right? So if you calculate that out, four times the benefits minus four times the cost, what do you get? Do you get a higher or a lower value and what number do you get? Right, so four times 0 0.8 minus four times 0 0.2. This is not, look, this is not like, we don't do math 
in this course because most of our math will be done by computers. That's why we do computational social science. But it gives you the intuition. I mean, this is basic. Use your phone to type it in uh, and to calculate it or, or, or do it by hand. But that's, that's basically, well, that's counting. That's what we, that's what we do. Okay. So four times 0 0.8 minus four times 0 0.2 is 2.4. That's twice as much benefits. So the network will, will be drawn towards, towards this, which is more beneficial to a society, right? It's more beneficial than this, than the empty network, which is zero. The one connection with one link is 1.2 and with two connection has 2.4. So it's more beneficial to add the second link. Society, our society of four nodes eventually will add the second link, right? So that's where the network will evolve. What's if I make the second link like this? So I connect the second link differently. Now I also have four benefits. Yeah, the four, four arrows, right? And four costs. These four arrows have benefits and costs. But now I have also indirect benefits. And that kind of like looks like this. So the lower two nodes also connect indirectly through one degree of separation. Now this indirect connection is there, but there's, according to our assumption, that our assumptions that we took, there is no cost associated with it because we said cost is associated with maintaining a connection with having an arrow coming into you. So that is actually then the maintaining. So we have, we have indirect benefits. It kind of like goes through here. And as a modeler, and that's, that's my assumption in the modeling, I can say, well, it has benefits, but it doesn't have costs. Or maybe it has a lower cost. It has a cost for somebody else. You can model that how you want, but we're going to keep it simple. Very simple here, not make it so complicated. You just say it has benefits, indirect benefits. And these indirect benefits, they are less than 0 0.8. So actually, I go through one to, to this one node, the intermediating node, and I keep on going so it makes sense to multiply them. So 0 0.8 times 0 0.8, which would be 0 0.64, right? 8 times 8, yeah. Uh, is 64. So 0 0.8 times 0. .8, yeah, it gets because it's, it's lower than one. So if I multiply them it gets lower, very, very convenient for us. So I said the indirect benefit is 0 0.64. So if I now calculate that out, I have a direct benefit, four times 0 0.8, minus a direct cost, four times 0 0.2, plus an indirect benefit. And, and, and I have that actually twice, right? I have one indirect benefit going from one node to the other one and the other way around. So two times 0 0.8 squared. So two times 0 0.64 basically. Now, if I, if I sum that up, I get a higher number, 3.68. So actually my benefit, my social benefit then uh, increased. Well, it's higher than the previous case because now I take advantage of these indirect effects as well. So the network actually it will, when it will add the second link, it won't add, it will tend to not maintain the second link independently on different nodes. It will add the second link rather to an already connected node, which gets richer logic, uh, because that has, this brings these indirect benefits with it according to our model setup. And you could set up, as I said, your model differently, but we keep it very simple here. So the, the, the evolution of this network would actually try to be, will actually tend to be pulled towards this configuration, the, the, this, this, this fourth configuration that we have here. Now, what happens if we, uh, if we add a third, a third connection and we add the third connection in the same rich get richer logic. So the one that's connected already gets this other connection. Well, we get six benefits minus six costs. And then how many indirect benefits do we get now? We get six indirect benefits. So we have six direct benefits, six costs, direct costs, and six indirect benefits. One going from this node to this node. These are two. One going from this node to this node, these are two, and the other the third one goes from this node to this node. So each one of these indirect routes, paths, actually has two, two connections, or there are two benefits, the one benefits and the other benefits as well when they're connected. So there are six indirect benefits, six times 0 0.8 squared. 
what we get here is wow, that's that's quite a, qu quite a quite a social benefit. Seven point four four. That's even higher. So the network would tend towards this configuration. This is the socially most beneficial network. But is it also stable? What happens, for example, if we would reorganize the third link? And, and, and put it like this. So basically that's, that's kind of like a straight line now, right? So all of them are, are connected and in in, in I could also pull it out. It would be a straight line. What would happen? What would happen then? Well, we have six direct benefits and, and, and six direct costs. How many indirect, uh, indirect benefits do we have? Yeah, that's a tricky question, actually, because we have, we have four indirect benefits of, 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 of path length two. So of, of two degrees of separation, we have one here, uh, and one here. And then we also have indirect benefits of three steps of separation, right? If you go from the first node, the first node can also go to the last node. It can go two steps, but it could also go all the way three steps. So how this was modeled here by Jackson. And his collaborators, what, how they model that, they then basically, well, multiply it again by 0 0.8. So each step kind of like reduces your benefit. The indirect benefits are not as much, since it's smaller than one. That's the good thing with normalizing. It would be 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.8. So it would give me then also two, two indirect benefits, but of a path length of three. Basically, and that would be then if you calculate that out, would look like this: zero point eight, uh, six times zero point eight minus six minus six uh, times zero point two, and then four four indirect connection of path length two, and two indirect connections of of path length three. That's the first, the first and the last node, right? They're also connected of path length three. Now, if I sum that up. I get a value that's actually smaller, 7.1, 7.1 something. So in, in the previous configuration, I had 7.44, and now I have 7.1. So the network will not evolve towards that. It's just not beneficial. It might, it might check it out just by trial and error, evolve towards that, but then go back again to this previous configuration of, of 7.44, because that's more beneficial. It will find out it's more beneficial. And if you look at it, the second to last configuration is actually a star network, right? So it's just organized a different way. There's one middle node and then these three hanging on. It's, it's, it's a star network with a configuration of, of, of four total nodes. And the question is, why stars? Well, because the shorter path length are more valuable than the longer path length. And the direct links have an intermediate trade-off between benefits and costs. That's why the star configuration is more beneficial than just having having basically a straight line. Is that, does that make sense? If not, please feel free to go back and and, and watch uh, this segment again. And if you get the basic intuition behind that model, you don't have to learn this model in detail. It's just one model, but that's basically the idea. We evolve networks until we have maximum efficiency then for society as a whole. And that leads us to our next question. So for society as a whole, I said, this is uniquely efficient, but what about uh, the individual nodes? Because nodes, we said, yes, the, the connections have benefits for nodes, but they also have costs. And if you look at the star configuration, well, the node in the middle, the node in the hub actually has the most connections, a lot of direct benefits, but it also carries a lot of the costs uh, and the other ones going with indirect benefits, uh, kind of like free they have, they don't have so many costs. So let's look, look a little bit, uh, in, in, in more detail about that. How is the fairness of the network actually among these network configurations and, and, and are all nodes equally happy inside the network, not as a, as a society as a whole? Okay. So let's look at this. That's, we said, that's our, that's our best social configuration. And we said there are six direct benefits, six direct costs, and six indirect benefits as well, right? You can go back and look at that, why that is. But let's calculate the benefits for each one of them. How does these, 
the, the total benefit of 7.44 or whatever the number is, how does it distribute among these four nodes? All right, so our middle node has three direct benefits and three direct costs. So just for the sake of, of, of seeing if you're still with me, uh, what would that be? Three direct benefits, three direct costs, according to our assumptions. 3 times 0 0.8 minus 3 uh, times 0 0.2, so 1.8. So the net benefit, benefit minus cost, the net benefit of the middle node is 1.8. What about the nodes, the pendant nodes, the, the connection nodes? So here with this node, we have one benefit, one direct benefit and one direct costs, right? This, this node only has one, one connection going into it. And then two indirect benefits. And we said the indirect benefits don't have any costs uh, because this person doesn't have to maintain more than one connection. And there are two indirect benefits that look like this, right? Now, what's the overall net benefit of this node? Just for the sake, of making sure you're still with me, please do me a favor, think about that it's 1.88, so it's higher. So uh, net costs and benefits considered, this node actually has a higher benefit than the middle node. What about the other two pendant nodes? Well, they are the same, right? Yes, I mean, you can do the same calculation now again. Also one Direct benefit, one direct cost, and two indirect gives also 1.88. So actually, the middle one is kind of like worse off here. Now, if you sum that up, all of these 1.88 times plus 1.88 plus 1.88 plus 1.8, you get you get the the 7.44 of total societal benefit, and we see that this total societal benefit is unequally distributed. Some, especially the middle node, actually has a, a less net benefit and, and, and will start complaining. Right? Like, I, I have to do the work here of intermediating. You guys are benefiting from these indirect benefits. And I'm like here in the middle just passing on messages all the time. And you guys over there, you only have to worry about one connection with me. And, and I have to talk with all three of you. So it's actually, that's not a comfortable, that's not a really comfortable situation. I'm just like, I'm out of here. I also want to be one of these pendant nodes. And if you give me the possibility somehow to do that, the societal pressure will try to keep him in, but it's not, you know, it's not a fair network. Uh, even so from a societal point of view, it's uniquely efficient. So what can we do here? What do you think could be done? Well, nothing that a little money couldn't solve, right? So basically, basically we bribe the one in the middle. No. Uh, so formally, uh, in terms of if, if you have a private sector, it would be a private sector negotiation would then happen like a bargain, a favor among individual and favor among individuals. And we basically would reimburse the middle one for these extra effort that the middle one is doing. If you are public sector authority, that means if you make the rules of the game, you wanna make sure that this middle hub is there. So what you would do is then you would subsidize, cross subsidize. For example, you would tax the other ones and you say, hey, I put a tax on you. I take some money from you and I redistribute it to subsidize this middle node. That's how we maintain this hub, which is crucial to benefit all of us. It benefits all of us with a small average path length messages or airplanes can travel can travel quicker and we need this so it's a mix of private and public sector negotiations that's how these things then are maintained in order to maintain the centralized hub and, and keep it happy and reimburse the centralized hub for the effort so how could we do that now here keeping up with our ide idealized uh, model here yeah, well we have 0 0.88 what if about if we take two cents away Right, so 0 0.2 we take away and give these 0 0.2 to the middle hub. So out of, let's say, $1.88, we take two cents away and, and, and give these two cents to the middle hub. Now, uh, this, this pendant node reduced its benefit. It, it had to, it, it was taxed. So it went down from 1.88 to 1.86 in the value, $1.86. It lost, it lost two cents. 
What about the other the other two? Well, for fairness reasons, we would tax them with the same rate. Also, two cents. Everybody chips in two cents. I take two cents from this one, give it to the central node. I take two cents from that one and give it to the central node. End of story is that all of my pendants have now a net benefit of 1.86 in my central node. Uh, oh, as well, 1.86, right? So now with this cross subsidy, Everybody is happy with this tax and redistribution, or it might be out of a private sector negotiation uh, in order to, to find now this really also fair. And now everybody is happy. The middle one says, okay, now I'm, I'm as good as all of you. Now we really have a stable, uh, a really a long-term stable network uh, given to the, due to this strategic network intervention that you had. By the way, again, if you do the math, right, just to see, like I didn't, I didn't invent anything or threw anything or threw any money in. If you take the total social value, which was 7.44, lots of numbers I know. 7.44, if you take, is the same as four times 1.86. So that's how you get the social value. And then the social, the social value is now uniformly equally distributed among all four nodes. Well, now we are we are good, and we achieved uh, a stable and efficient equilibrium thanks to this this intervention. And that's how you can think about. That's how you create networks. You try to make them efficient. You try to make them as stable as possible uh, in the long term in order to also maintain them. And then there are some market dynamics. You can think about that. So market dynamics that actually make the network evolve towards some states and sometimes then also, well, you can even have strategic intervention in order to make a network stable at the point where it is because the market sometimes might drive you to an inefficient state, a state that is not as efficient or always go, go between two states and then you can never do something because uh, you're always switching back and forth and you just want a stable configuration in order to be able to build well, something like societies, right, or, or, or market structures, uh, be it in the economics. But it's that also applies to social dynamics and social configurations that you want stable social networks. Now, that sounds great, but now comes the bad news. Uh, and the bad news is, unfortunately, it doesn't always work. It can be extremely frustrating because making the world a fair place uh, is, 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 it sometimes doesn't work just mathematically. Really, it doesn't work. And, and sometimes it might be necessary that you have to give something to someone without taking from anybody else. That means you require some outsized resources. You take from another network, for example. So you might take from another industry to subsidize this this industry and make this industry stable that you're interested in. Or um, you have to take away from somebody, but then don't give to anybody else. So basically, you accumulate extra resources, which then might be used maybe in another time, might be used later, or might be given to somebody else. So this can also sometimes happen. So it's not uh, often, sometimes it can happen that you, with your network yourself, you won't be able to solve it. And then, but this network, of course, is part of a larger network, part of a larger network. And at the end, it's, it's well, it's difficult to make the world a fair place. That's just the message I want to leave you with. And if you're interested in it, I, I highly invite you to study that more because yes, the world absolutely needs uh, more fairness and, and, and these are very intricate problems. And don't worry, we, you won't usually do this uh, by hand with accounting like we did. I just did this in order to show you some intuitions. Usually you would simulate that as well on a computer and if you want to solve it numerically and find some stable configurations, you can do that with a computer. Or, of course, I mean, if you're good enough in the math, in the math, you can have some analytical solutions as well and work through the hard math. But in general, that's the idea, right? You try to to increase social efficiency, so the sum of the values of everybody should be high, and the sum of of the total should be high, and social stability. So nobody can get better off by changing the network, essentially. So you try to optimize both, and sometimes there's a trade-off between, between both of them. And I, the basic point of this entire example that I walked you through in detail is that you can try to start to imagining a little bit how this can be done, how we can design, and we can design efficient and stable networks. Uh, for example, as I've shown you, if I tried to show you uh, in this example. So that ends what I want to tell you about this 
this very big question that we have here, how can we predict what kind of networks will form and how do different kinds of network form? I, I walked you through four stylized network, random networks, scale-free networks, small world networks, both of which appear often in social settings. And then the last one, uh, I walked you even through not just the justification was not this network will form because we often find it in society and there was no social theory. It was actually more like a mathematical and economic theory behind uh, why this hub and spoke network would be uniquely efficient uh, for one. And then also, especially with our subsidies, we could also make it stable, right? Nobody would be better off by changing uh, anything and everybody would be happy. So that ends the second question, which will lead us now to our last question for today. How we, can we predict what will happen inside the network? So for now, we've been growing networks. So that's a dynamic. Something is changing on the network. The nodes and links are changing. And now let's take a stable network and see what happens inside the network. So something, for example, like something spreading in the network, a diffusion model, uh, a disease could spread in the network or a rumor could spread or an innovations could spread, some, some new product or some new idea could spread uh, into the network. And, uh, and the, then also the network chain. And that depends on the network structure. That's another kind of prediction I can make in network dynamics. What will happen given a certain network structure? And I want to work with here with another net logo simulation. You, you see, you're starting to get used to this, uh, to this net, net logo software. And this is from Lada Adamic who right now works works in Facebook. Uh, and she left, she did a, before she did a Coursera online course when she was still at the University of Michigan. She, have, she programmed this, this very nice app that I want to play with right now. And that allows us to see how something spreads on a network, a disease or, or an opinion, uh, according to the different network configurations. Let's start out with a network configuration of a, a, a random network. So a, a uniformly distributed random network, as you can see it here. And, and the idea is, the question is, how long does it take that the disease or the rumor spreads to everybody in the network, according to this, in, given this network configuration that we have? So that's what we want to simulate now, the change on the network? How long does it take until everybody is infected or everybody has heard this rumor, for example, or this, this fake news? So we start out with one node being infected and necessarily in this model, we, we programmed like this, that each connected node will also get infected. So we start out with one and this one node will get infected. Now this node is connected to three other nodes. So these three in the next time step will necessarily be infected as well. You could have another probability there, but that's that's the choice that we've been making here to keep things simple. So you necessarily get infected once somebody you know uh, is infected. And now we see, okay, now well, there's still one left. Now we went through the entire network and it took 14 time steps. We can see that here in this diffusion steps uh, curve, let's do that again and see how many time steps we need now to infect the entire network. And we can see uh, we're almost there. There's still, oh, here's still one. How long did it take? 13. 30, well, pretty similar, a little different. Let's do it again. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. A little longer. 13, 14, 16 time steps. And again, every time it depends, the network is random. It's a little different. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So about now 15 time steps that, that we have here. And now we connected, we connected every, we infect, we infected everybody. Now let's make that uh, um, a preferential attachment network. So now we have a different network configuration. We don't have uh, a random network, but a preferential attachment network. Uh, a scale-free network, you know already that looks different and we see how quickly now the, the disease or the rumor spreads on this network, all right? So here we have, in a preferential network, we have these characteristic hubs, the richer that got richer while the network was growing. And let's see how long we need. So we start with one infected node, we need one, two, 
you know, one, and it, it hit into a hub. Two, oh, wow, now a lot of people got infected. Then it hit into that hub. And as you can see, well, that, that, looks, that looks a little bit faster, right? So we only need seven steps, seven steps to reach the entire network. Let's, let's do that again, just to make sure there was a coincidence. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven again. Uh, one more, eight. So then we can actually read the seven or eight again, the same one, and we can do that. In, and you will uh, basically find that you need much less steps. Why? Well, if you look at that, you can see why. Because once you reach one of these hubs, and it's very likely that you reach a hub, because the hubs are very connected, kind of like catapults the disease or the rumor out to a lot to a lot of other people. So in a, in a, in a scale-free network, in a preferential attachment network, things diffuse much faster than in a random network because you have these hubs which exponentially catapult the message to many others. And you very quickly get to these hubs. Why? Well, these hubs are very connected. It's very likely that you are connected to a hub, so you very quickly get to, to these hubs. So hubs are important by square, actually. Why? Because they are more likely to get the disease because they're just connected to many, uh, and they are more likely to pass the disease on. Because once they get the disease, which is very likely to get to them, just because they have so many friends and one of them, one of them has the disease or might have heard the rumor, then they're very likely to be, to be infected and then they will pass it on to many others, right? So they're important by square, actually. So a node with a degree of a thousand, with a thousand the connection, actually is a million times, a thousand times a thousand more likely to be contagious. Contagious being the reception and the passing on. So how would you then eliminate a, a disease? Usually, uh, diseases, vaccinations, for example, are taken care of by, by pretty much random vaccination, right? There's a vaccination campaign and somebody says, come to the local school to get vaccinated or go to your doctor and then get vaccinated. Here's the flu vaccine. So I'm like, Let's vaccinate just everybody randomly. And if, if we cover enough randomly, like that's, that would be the, the disease would be contained. Now, from a network perspective, does that make sense? Think about it. What would be the best strategy? A random vaccination strategy or what would you suggest? Let's look at this network. So if this network, if we randomly vaccinate two people, we might pick these two. Okay, so these two are vaccinated and the network is still pretty much intact. So the disease can still flow around the network. What if we vaccinate the hubs, the, the one with a lot of connections here in the center? We basically, by vaccinating them, we broke the network apart, right? We broke the network into pieces. So now the disease cannot flow anymore in this network because it gets stopped by these people who have central roles. Now in the same in the same logic, if you, for example, work with a terrorist network, that as well, what, what the military then tries to do is eliminate these central hubs because it will break apart uh, the terrorist network. On the other hand, if you want to diffuse something, a political opinion or an innovation, uh, something like this, you also want to contact the nodes because they catapult this message out to many others. And in another session, we talked about then different measures. If you have an eigenvector centrality measure, it catapults and it catapults and it catapults. If, if you don't remember anymore, what, what was eigenvector centrality and degree centrality? Yes, feel free, feel free to check, check back on that. So actually, it's been shown that using the page rank centrality, page rank centrality is an eigenvector centrality. Page rank is from, from Google. So that's how Google ranks the pages. It uses this eigenvector centrality, which has to do with the friends of friends. So not how many friends you have, but how many friends your friends always have, or not only how many web page links, hyperlinks your web page has, but how many hyperlinks do the web pages have? How many links link to the pages that your page links to, right? That gives you more points in the page rank. So it's an eigenvector centrality metric. It has been shown that using that, that metric, a computer simulation shows that you need less than half of the vaccinations if you go smartly about it and vaccinate the people with the highest uh, page rank centrality. Now, what, what I always wondered, 
in, in practical, so doing social science and being a social scientist, I want to say, how do they find these people? Right? How do you in practice find the people with the highest degree or eigenvectors? And it's not like people know their eigenvector centrality and you don't know you don't know the network. It's not like the network is all mapped out in your in your in your community and you can just go and look at the network of this community and know who are the central people and then say, hey, you and you go get vaccine, right? You like I always wonder, so how do they do it? It sounds all nice in theory. Well, with a digital footprint nowadays in social networks, people reveal a lot about their social networks. So we know who are people who are in touch with many, and we can detect that if you would really go and analyze the social networks, there are privacy concerns here, of course, uh, that we would have to consider. But it's much more like we have much more social network reveals nowadays than we had before in the past. Uh, but there's another, actually, when I looked into this issue, I found another way that actually people are doing that when they, when they vaccine people. And that's a very ingenious, very creative way. So you find these hubs basically by make use of the network yourself uh, to find the network structure. As logic as it sounds, how does that in practice? So, for example, uh, you, you, you ask people to randomly name some friends. So you tell them, well... Tell me the name of, of a few friends. People give you the name of the friends and they say, okay, thank you very much. You go ahead and you vaccina vaccinate those friends. Yeah, funny, right? So <laughs> I say that again. You ask people to name some friends. You don't vaccinate those people, the people you ask. You go ahead and you vaccinate their friends. Why would you do that? Well, it's a logic we already have mentioned uh, because it's very likely that your friends are connected to highly connected people, right? It's uh, just because the other way around, like look at it the other way around. Highly connected people have many, many connections, have many friends. Well, that, that makes them highly connected. So it makes them likely that the person you ask is also connected to a highly connected person, right? So if you ask people about their friends or about people they know, with more probability, I mean, this is not exact social science in this sense, it's, it's always probabilistic, but with a high probability, they mention somebody's highly connected, so I go ahead and vaccinate them. And then I have more likelihood, nothing is guaranteed, this is not a deterministic exercise, but with more likelihood, I'm going to catch somebody who's highly connected. Right. And on average, over many, many vaccinations, I'm going to get, I'm going to get these hubs. <laughs> That's actually how people do that. I found that, I found that very creative. All right, so that that uh, actually wraps up. This was a quite advanced, a quite advanced lesson. Feel free to, to look over it again and look into it again. Uh, some things uh, were quite advanced in this, and it it, it moved us towards simulations now. Right now, we're starting to do theory. Now, not all theory has to do with counting zero point eight and zero point twos and and all of that. We will do theory mainly in these computer simulations by simulating it. And I showed you a little bit as well how fun that can be, or, or how visually intuitive that can be in order to do that. And and we will explore these kind of simulations more in this course. But wrapping up for today, because social networks are very important for social science and computation analysis. First of all, the digital footprint made social networks much more visible. We always were living in social networks because we are social creatures uh, as human beings. Uh, but social networks, the digital social networks made it, became much more visible with the digital footprint. Computational power helped us to compute uh, them much more and to simulate them. And today we've simulated and we understood them much more about networks and actually also how networks evolve. Uh, thanks to the advances we made in the last few years with our computational scientific methods. So the questions that we had for today is, first of all, how do networks evolve? And I said this question can be answered in two terms. One, one is you can ask about what kind of network will form. And I said, actually, we can predict, and I showed you some ways of how you can actually predict how different networks form. That depends on the mechanism that you assume or that you have identified of how they form. For example, a preferential attachment mechanism, a small world mechanism, uh, or then you can also see uh, an economic mechanism of, of gains and costs, and then what network will form when you have certain kinds of networks, such as we said, efficient and stable uh, networks. And then last question was, uh, what will happen 
on the network. So the network would be stable and something happens on the network like a disease or, or, or something spreads on the network. Innovation diffuses on the network. And we can also make predictions and we can think about how these, how these networks change. So, as I said, that was a quite advanced lesson. Feel free to go back and look at some of, of, of these topics again. I hope in general, I gave you a general intuition about this. It's a, it's a very complex, complicated thing. Networks are complex, complex things. And social networks especially always change. Uh, we might take snapshots and look at them. But we make the, these snapshots, they are, they are, they're basically artificial, just makes it easier for us. In reality, social networks continuously evolve and reconfigure. And I wanted to make sure to give you a little bit of intuition about this can be done. Uh, in parallel, we use some computer simulations already and did some theory, which will now also lead us to another very important part of computational methods. And that's the idea how you can do theory with the help of computers. And you do that just as we did today by simulating certain social configurations and dynamics. All right, see you next time.